Some of you may be familiar with the concept of an open secret. An open secret is the kind of thing that uh, it, it exists such that most everyone knows it, but no one talks about it, and we live in general denial that it's true. Y'all know what I'm talking about? This happens a lot in the South. There are a lot of open secrets in the South. And there are some even in the church. Today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll not be surprised. We don't say it all the time. Not everyone in the church is married. Did you hear me? Not everyone in the church is married. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes when we talk about marriage, or even as we exist as a church, we live in such a way as if every family, every family is one mom, one dad, two and a half kids, and that's the way it exists. But that is not the way many or even most of our lives exist. And that's okay. And I feel like as we start talking about this passage today, it's important that we acknowledge that. That not everyone in the church is married. That not everyone in the church who has been married has experienced the sort of marriage that Paul describes here. That not every marriage shows us what it looks like for Christ to love the church. And yet, Yet this is what Paul offers to us as he instructs the whole church on what it looks like to live in faithful relationship with one another, on what it looks like for us to set aside our old ways and to embrace a new way of being offered to us by the grace of Jesus. He jumps from what we talked about last week, what we read last week, where he finished by saying, be subject to one another out of reverence, out of fear, out of all of Jesus, be subject to one another. And then he starts in verse 22, wives, be subject to your husbands. And it's really important that we hold these passages together because of that link. Subject yourselves to one another. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Because this is not a command just for wives. This is a command for everyone in the church to be subject to someone. We're going to come back around to that, but before we do, I want to say a little bit more about what this thinking about discipleship in the context of marriage invites us to. Because for some of you, you may have to go back a couple of years to remember what it was like to be single and to desire to have a spouse or maybe just a boyfriend, or someone to go steady with, or a word I didn't learn until my adulthood, someone to go sparking with. Maybe you see this in your kids and your grandkids. Maybe you're experiencing it on your own right now as a single person. The angst of singleness. Have you experienced this? Do you you remember it? Are you experiencing it now? The deep desire to have Someone with whom you belong. Someone that you know, even if the rest of the world doesn't think so, finds you likable, attractive, beautiful, or handsome. That because of that person, you know your social location, you know your worth, you know that you have a sense of belonging, you know that you are loved. Not feeling those things is the angst of singleness, right? Not sure if you belong. Not sure if anyone really likes you enough to spend their whole life with you. Not sure if you even fit because the world is designed for families that exist with two two parents and two and a half kids. As we lean into that angst of of singleness, we, we get romantic comedies that produce for us lines like, you complete me, right? Maybe some of you love that movie. I don't blame you if you do. But what that kind of perspective of romantic relationships looks like is self-fulfillment, self-worth, and self-authentication. That I can find who I am in relationship with another person, preferably a romantic partner. Self-fulfillment, self-worth, 
self-actualization. These are the things that drive, these desires are what drive our angst in singleness. Which is a lot of self, right? It doesn't really sound that romantic at all to be so needy, to need a place to belong, to need to know that you're likable, to need to know that someone thinks you're beautiful sounds desperate, not loving. The best romance is when you, out of sheer delight in someone else, can let them know that they are beautiful and worthy and have a place in the world. It's the same thing just from the other side, but it shifts everything. And instead of needing those things for yourself, you seek to offer them to another person. This angst for a partner, this desire to be loved that so many people experience in singleness, not everyone, not everyone who's single wants to be married, but for a lot of folks who are, this angst, this desire to be known and loved and to belong is a desire that only Jesus can fill. And I know that that might sound trite, but it is true. It is true that you cannot find anyone in this world other than Jesus who can complete you and make you whole and present you blameless and spotless before God our Father. He's the only one who really knows how beautiful you are He's the only one who really knows how worthy you are. And He's the only one in whom you can find a life with purpose and belonging that is sustainable. Because every other human is going to fail you. Even the best husband, even the best wife will. And it's important that we acknowledge that in the midst of reading this passage today. So, as we acknowledge that not all of us are married, as we acknowledge that Marriage is not the pinnacle of human existence in the way that sometimes even the church makes it seem to be. Let's talk about the role that marriage can play in the life of discipleship. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Out of fear of Christ, you should be under someone else's authority. I told you all last week, this is why I'm in a covenant group. A group of other pastors we meet uh, by Zoom every Tuesday and in person as often as we can so that we can speak to one another about what's going on in our lives and sometimes offer words of correction, of exhortation, of encouragement to one another. When we're making big decisions, we don't do it on our own, but in consultation with them. Everyone in the church is under authority. Some of the church fathers writing about this passage said, even bishops... Even priests, even ministers of the gospel are under the authority of someone. This command in verse 21 is intended for the whole church. Subject yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Our relationship with Jesus is never just us and Jesus because as individuals we might discern things wrongly. So we subject ourselves to one another in love, praying that God will lead us together even if one of us is inclined to go astray. Everyone is subject to someone else. And when you find your place in Christ, when you find your place in the church, you can develop healthy and fruitful relationships that look like mutual subjection to one another. And that may or may not be a romantic relationship. But if you are married, or if you are called to marriage at some point in your life, your spouse is your nearest neighbor. And in all of the ways that we are called to love our neighbor, we are called to love our spouse. And in all of the ways that we love our spouse, it is a further expression of what it looks like to love our neighbor. So Paul says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, the body of which he's the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. He doesn't say a whole lot here. 
You may notice he says a lot more to the husbands than he does to the wives. And what he says to the wives is dependent on what he says to the husbands in what follows. The truth is that in Paul's world, women are very used to being subject to other people. They can't own property. They can't be a credible witness to testify in court. They are not reliable or trustworthy or empowered in nearly any way outside of the household. They know what it is to be subject to men in every aspect of their lives. So Paul doesn't need to tell them much about this mutual subjection because they have a great deal of experience in it. But when he starts speaking to the husbands, he says things that are surprising. He says things that can transform marriages, that can make it sound like the wife's subjection is not a bad gig because the husbands are subject as well. And as he begins to flesh that out, he sets it up in the light of Jesus' love for the church. Jesus, who was in the heavenly places with the Father, perfectly comfortable, perfectly happy, didn't need a thing in the world, and chose to enter into human existence as a baby, dependent on his mother to nurse him, depending on his father to teach him how to walk and talk, subjecting himself to religious and political authorities that would take his life. Knowingly, he did these things. He gave up all of his power and authority and subjected himself to all of these people out of love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water and by the Word, so as to present the church to Himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle of any kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. Jesus' job with the church, with every one of us, no matter what your experience of life has been, no matter what mistakes you have made, no matter what sin has characterized your life, in the short or long term, this is the work of Jesus. To offer His life in such a way that we can stand before Him as a bride adorned for her husband, beautiful without a wrinkle in the dress, without a flaw on our face, without blemish at all, and know that we are loved. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. This is the work that Jesus is doing in the church. And so in the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for his own body, the church. And then he goes to quote this passage from Genesis, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, Paul says. And what I'm talking about is Christ and the church. This kind of love, this kind of love is so far beyond what we usually think of as adequate spousal love, right? I I, I pay the bills. I show up every night. I, I come home. I don't go somewhere else. I don't abuse you or hurt you. All those things are baseline expectations for a spouse, for sure. But Paul sets the standard even further along. Paul says that all of us, even husbands, because it might cost them more in his world, are to love like Jesus, offering ourselves in subjection to the other offering ourselves in love that doesn't just not harm the other one, but that helps them to grow and to thrive in all of their life and beauty so that they can stand holy before the Lord because of how we have lived and loved with them throughout our lives. This is the task. Husbands, love like Jesus, which will come at great cost to you. Love like Jesus, which requires you to know Jesus and to continue to learn about Jesus 
and to continue to become like Jesus. I think that this word is especially important for our world today because so many of our families let the men take the back, the men take a back seat in the spiritual lives of their families. They let their wives handle the discipleship of their kids all on their own. They leave them alone for all of that work and don't take an active interest. And Paul says that men should be involved in that too. Helping themselves and helping their spouse look more like Jesus. To do this, you've got to be invested in your own spiritual life. You've got to be growing and becoming like Jesus yourself so that you can love like Him. And as you live and love like Jesus, your life will bear fruit in your family. They will begin to look more like Jesus as well. And this is one way within a family that Jesus begins to adorn us for Himself as His bride at the wedding feast that will last for all the ages where no one is left out, where there is a seat for everyone who would like to be there, where all of us without blemish, without a spot, eager to join our groom Jesus with whom we find belonging and value and purpose and worth, in whom we find completion. At that wedding feast, that's where we're going. And Paul says that our marriages can become a witness to that kind of love. That people can look at the ways that spouses love one another, women and men love one another, and give themselves up for one another, love and respect each other, subject themselves to one another. That people can look at that and say, I I might understand a little bit better about how Jesus loves the church. And if that's the power of marriage, we should be very careful not to demean it. Which is another thing we, especially men, are inclined to do. To groan about our spouses, to groan about the difficulties of marriage. When someone, some young man is getting married, the number of times that they hear, are you sure you want to do this, son? Is a little bit too much. It's a little bit too much. Because people do need to know that marriage comes at great cost. We should not obscure that fact. We also should not obscure the fact that in faithful marriage, people can see how Jesus has loved the church. What an opportunity to bear the light of Christ to the world. That we become more like Jesus in a way that we can make our families more like Jesus. Not just not actively causing harm to one another, but building one another up in love, which has been what Paul has been telling us our gifts are for all along. And so he's taken these general commands and now he's making them very particular to what happens in a household. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Subject yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ within your marriage and within all of your lives. Then Paul makes the turn back at the end. He says, this is a wonderful mystery. And I'm talking about Christ and the church. So love your wife as yourself, and a wife should respect her husband. As Paul does this, he offers us in a window into the intimacy that God longs to have with us. There are things about marital relationships that are held only within those relationships faithfully. And Paul says, Jesus loves you that well and more. That Christ wants to adorn you as His bride without blemish, without spot, at the marriage for all of the ages where we can know the glory and the love of God. This is what we're invited to. Adorned by Christ's grace, we find ourselves beautiful and worthy and belonging. And while we wait for that feast at the end of the ages, at the wedding feast of the Lamb, we get to have a taste of it today. As we come as single people, as married people, as widowed people, as divorced people, as whatever our household looks like, we get to come. And at the Lord's table, we find ourselves belonging. 
We find our worth. We find how we are completed. As the bread of life is offered to us, as the cup of salvation is given to us, we find healing. And we find wholeness. And we find all of the things that we might be seeking in other places, including in romantic relationships. And we can't reliably find it there. But you can reliably find it here, at the table where Christ comes to meet us and to declare that he loves us and that we have a place with him at the wedding feast. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, you know the deepest desires of our heart. And you know how we are inclined to pursue those things separate from you and how that brings us always to disappointment eventually, to grief and to pain and to sorrow. And so we ask, O Lord, that you would bring us to yourself, that in you our restless hearts could find rest, in you our hungry souls could find satisfaction, in you our thirst for life could be satiated, such that we are never thirsty again. We pray, O Lord, that in Jesus, we would find ourselves to be beautiful. We would find a place where we belong. That we would find that we are indeed not only likable, but lovable. That we would find that by the grace of God, we are with you. That Christ is our head and us as his body, knit together with everyone else, with a mission for the world. Teach us to love, O oh Lord. Teach us to love well within the covenant of marriage. Teach us to love well outside the covenant of marriage. Teach us what it means to be subject to one another out of fear of you so that we can grow by your grace and stand before you blameless when that day comes. Though that work may feel impossible, for you all things are possible. For you are the one who does more than we could ask or imagine. This we pray in your name. Amen.